Okay, I'm jumping forward a little bit here. I think this is disc number 57. I should have been doing 51, I think. But, you know, I'm gonna take what I can get. Let's get this going. Can't read any of that. What? Can't read any of that. <laughs> Let's skip over all this for the time being and go straight to the vault. So much extra stuff that they added on these PS2 demo discs. Medal of Honor Frontline. Oh, shit. Medal of Honor. Um, Medal of Honor started the World War II first-person shooter craze of the late '90s and early 2000s. It was basically the most popular first-person shooter genre or era, whatever there was for a number of years. So much so that people started mocking how many World War II first-person shooter games there were. I should probably pay attention to some of this. Oh, it actually sort of controls a little bit like a modern first-person shooter. Dual stick control. Uh, left stick controls movement. Right stick controls... Uh, it's, it's a little bit clunky, though. Should just drive through that gate? First-person shooters. Uh... Sorry, bro. Oh, you're not German. Oh, yes, you are. <laughs> oh, my God, this is terrible. You know what would be nice? A target reticule. <laughs> there we go. Is that how you reload? <laughs> So, Medal of Honor first came out on the PlayStation 1, and it was a sign that the PlayStation 1 could actually do good first-person shooters. Now, you saw first-person shooters in the early PlayStation 1, and we're talking like Doom. The PlayStation version of Doom was actually a very good version of Doom, and Doom was like the preeminent first-person shooter back in the early 90s and into the mid-90s. Like, everybody was like, oh, well, does it have a good version of Doom? Well, you know what? PlayStation had an excellent version of Doom. But as technology moved forward, you started to see, like, oh, well, first-person shooters have evolved. So you saw games like, uh, on the PC, you saw Half-Life, and you saw Tribes, and you saw Unreal, and you saw, like, um, Quake, and all that kind of stuff. The Doom more or less just got left behind. And on the N64, you had Goldeneye, as well as Perfect Dark later, which honestly, I didn't feel like it was all that good. Performance-wise, it was a piece of garbage. PlayStation, though, didn't really get its 
first-person shooter thing that everybody really could look uh, look up to. Oh, that's not the reload. How do I reload? Just gotta be out of ammo to reload. <laughs> Until Medal of Honor came out. Press crouch. Which one is crouch? There we go. It's L2. And then Medal of Honor came out. Now, Medal of Honor... I mean, like, the PlayStation 1 was not a machine that just jumps to his feet. Oh, you're on my side. <laughs> the PlayStation 1 was really not a machine that was designed for the sort of pure 3D environments that we saw in first-person shooters. But Medal of Honor... DreamWorks Interactive, whoever the hell actually developed it, I don't know, was actually a good first-person shooter. Something, they managed to pull it off. And Medal of Honor 2 came out, I didn't play that as much, but it was even better. So everyone was wondering, like, oh man, how good is Medal of Honor on the PlayStation 2 going to turn out? And I guess I got my answer here, not very I guess this wasn't too bad. I mean, it's definitely an improvement over Medal of Honor 1 and Medal of Honor 2 on account of, you know, the dedicated dual stick controls, better, larger environments, all that kind of stuff. How do I get over there? <laughs> lead the way. Yeah, yeah, you lead the way, motherfucker. <laughs> Did I just blow myself up? All right, never mind. <laughs> I remember wanting to get this game so bad. I'm, I guess now I know why I didn't. <laughs> and I'm dead. All right, let's skip out of this. Medal of Honor was a huge deal, though. I was so excited for what we'd eventually get on the PlayStation 2. And I I now know why I'd never bought Medal of Honor for the PS2. There were a lot of game series that I was a big fan of on the PlayStation 1, and then when they landed on the PS2, um, I dropped off. Like I'd mentioned in the previous Demo Disc Theater, or a previous Demo Disc Theater episode, that the Armored Core series, a From Software game, Big fan, oh, Fatal Frame. Big fan on the PlayStation 1. PS2 did not make the, uh, did not make the jump to PS2 well, in my opinion. So, you know, it's kind of weird. Fatal Frame, it's a Tecmo game. Fatal Frame, a lot of people consider this to be the best of the survival horror games. It's been two weeks since I last heard from my brother. But he left a note that led me to this place. I felt as though something was calling me here. The freaky game. I'll give it that. What? <laughs> Alright, so it's a first... It's not Well, it's not a first-person shooter. It's a third-person. Look at this. It's got sort of the... Oh, alright. Cutscene. Say so.
camera. And I press uh, the shooting stands X or R1 while in finder mode. Uh, I'll just figure this out. All right, so you're in a haunted house and your only way of fighting is to use your camera. The camera, you take a picture of a ghost and you damage it with that picture. I'm not as big of a fan of this series. I didn't play much of it. It just, it just didn't speak to me, you know. Can she run? There, oh, I, sort of. <laughs> so we got a sort of Resident Evil-ish third person uh, camera. Although, because it's a PlayStation 2 game, they used a lot of 3D environments. So the camera's panning around, sort of like in Code Veronica here. Yes, you can see through him. It's not your brother. Unless he's dead. I don't know. God, you run so slow. Ghost has appeared. Alright, so, where's he at? Oh, alright. <laughs> I'm fucking this up real bad. <laughs> Okay, so I'm fucking this up because I'm trying to... I would sort of expect the circle button to be the run button. But it's not. And I think I got some sort of graphical glitch. I can't see him. Because I'm running this on an emulator. There's some sort of a graphical glitch with the alpha channel that they're trying to use to show the ghost. It's basically invisible to me. I can't see it. And I'm... I, okay, I didn't have a chance. <laughs> I couldn't see the ghost. I'm playing this on an emulator, so things like that will happen. Based on a true story, really, is it? <laughs> Hurdy-gurdy. Hurdy-gurdy. We already played a demo of that. I'll jump into it, but I'm not going to stick with this. The weird game I didn't remember existed. Oh, it's a video. All right. Eidos Interactive. Eidos is owned by... Eidos got bought up by Crystal Dynamics, who then... Oh, Core. Okay, so Core, I think, got bought out by Eidos. And then Eidos got bought up by Crystal Dynamics, and Crystal Dynamics is bought up by Square Enix. Oh, so this is a, this is a demo. All right. It's a game I didn't remember existed, and I kind of still don't remember it exists in a way. Oh, it's glitchy as fuck. Oh, that's a loading screen. <laughs> don't make me stick with this. I don't want to see this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hurry up. Two loading screens to get to the damn menu so I can watch another... Right. I... No. Yeah, 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 yeah. Herd bunnies. Do it. Yeah, so How this... About it? No, god damn it. <laughs> was there a demo in this or was there just a video? Because now that I'm playing it, I don't remember <laughs> playing it. 
But you you heard things. I mean, you're still within the in a in a sense, you're still in the era of the PlayStation where you had a lot of smaller developers. Okay, so in the the SNES days, and it continued with the N64 especially. Game development started to get more expensive. You couldn't just do it one or two people. You had to have a team of people. And then you would have the sort of draconian controls that Nintendo or whoever would have over what could be released on their machine. So it was expensive to develop. And then you had to worry about your cost of distribution because cartridges were expensive. Cartridges are still expensive. Uh, Switch games are oftentimes cut down for the sake of using smaller cartridges. Well, you have... In the... Um, so, for the SNES or the N64 or whatever, a, a lot of times, games would not be made simply because like a studio or a publisher or whatever didn't want to not just risk spending the money on developing it, but spend money on distribution, because distribution, manufacturing a cartridge would say be like 20% of the selling price, or something like that, of the cartridge. So it's like, okay, well, we're expecting to sell a million units of something, and then you sell maybe half of that, 500,000. You're going to have 500,000 units worth of expensive cartridges that you manufacture that you can't sell. And that's really expensive because the upfront cost of manufacturing was so high. Well, the PlayStation comes along and the CD format is a lot easier, a lot cheaper to manufacture. It's like, oh, well, you expect to sell a million units? Fuck, make two million. Throw them all on the market. What sells, sells. What doesn't, doesn't. And it was so much cheaper to do it on the PlayStation that it sort of became a the place to be for a lot of smaller games, a lot of smaller studios to work their magic. Plus, Sony wasn't wasn't quite as much of a bunch of dicks as um, Nintendo was with their, a lot of their stuff. PlayStation 2, of course, it uses DVDs as well as CDs, so the cost of distribution is still low. But, it, but the machine being more powerful sort of pushes the cost of development up because you're, um, like, if you look at this, this character has more polygons than, like, a PlayStation 1 version of the character does. So it's going to take more time to create something like this. And it's not just the character, it's the entire world. Plus, there were a lot of complaints of the PlayStation 2 being a difficult thing to program. And I... It's, I've looked at the specs and where the PlayStation 2 was designed and built, and like there's some logic to that argument, though it was a little bit overplayed. So the costs and stuff did go up, but it was still... You didn't have to have insanely high development costs like, like uh, a cartridge-based system was, and Sony was friendly more friendly to smaller developers. All right, I'm out of here. <laughs> Sony was more friendly to smaller developers than Nintendo was at the time. So you started to see, you still saw a lot of weird little games like this come out. Like this... <sighs> yeah. Like where are these quotes from? You'll never see anything like Hurdy Gurdy. It's easily one of the most striking titles in the PS2. Who said that? The detail is almost scary. This will be a truly mass massive release. Was it? Who who are these quotes from? <laughs> You're making shit up. <laughs> Mad Maestro. I do remember hearing about this. This was some kind of a rhythm game. Not change the disc. All right. Trash games. Oh. If that tells you everything you need to know, then... <laughs> Dessert? Oops.
Rhythm games, I'm never a huge fan of them, although, um, like Guitar Hero, just like everybody else, I was into. Alright. Just like everyone else, I was into Guitar Hero and Rock Band. Those are rhythm games. And sort of like the ultimate expression of the rhythm game. But you had a lot of stuff in on the PlayStation 2 era that were... A lot of stuff in the PlayStation 2 era that were rhythm games. Fuck, I'm doing something wrong here. Oh, no. Oh, he's crying. <laughs> he's crying. I'm sorry, dude. <laughs> Let's do this one more time. I have a feeling this is going to suck anyway. Okay. This sucks. At least I'm doing better. The terrible rendition. I'm sorry for <laughs> forcing you to listen to this. Okay, it's not like a rhythm game in the sense of like Guitar Hero or the dance mini games or whatever. Alright, I'm getting out of here. It's more of a timing game. No, quit. <laughs> we got the point, I think. <laughs> March 02. No. No, don't take me back to the menu. Screw you. No! Out! Out! I went out! <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Pirates! The Legend of Black Cat. I don't remember this. Westward, huh? Westward was best known for the Command & Conquer series. It's a studio that's since been closed down. You know, I don't know if they still make Command & Conquer games. EA clearly owns the rights to it. Yeah, let's skip over all that. EA owns the rights to Command & Conquer, but I don't know if there are any Command & Conquer games... ...anymore. Sync. Oh, okay, so... Pirate Simulator. Like I'm playing Assassin's Creed Black Flag. Although not being able to lock on is a bit of a... Oh, I got him. Wow, that motherfucker exploded. What was on that? Oh, there's another one. Still a little difficult to control. Yeah, this wouldn't have been a bad game for its day. I mean, it feels clunky compared to what Assassin's Creed did with Black Flag and Rogue. But, oh, I'm running aground. Oh. <laughs> is this what the entire game is, though? Okay. You are a fool to resist me, Governor. These islands are now mine. <laughs> Not while I still breathe, Hawk. As you wish. <laughs> what? Oh, shit. Thought you weren't gonna kill him, considering what... There's a fire in the town. My father's life may be in danger. The governor? 
I'm going ashore. I'll have to make my way to town on foot. Pick me up when the tide comes in. I got you. The accents are killing me. My dearest Katarina, my wounds are deep and my life is fleeting. <laughs> there is much to tell you and little time. Your mother, my beloved Mara. Why are you writing with your left hand if your sword hand was your right? What I the fuck? I told you for fear that you would follow in her footsteps. You're doing this without an inkwell either. Things, she would have wanted that. They are hidden beneath the floor of this room. You must visit your mother's grave. You find it. Did he write that slowly? Is that what happened there? <laughs> My mother was a pirate? Well, you are too. I mean, don't judge. <laughs> You're not going to take the flag with you? Oh, okay, so... Is there any on-land stuff? Is there all... Okay, there is. The Wind Dancer. Ah, okay, so... Third-person... Action combat. Okay, that's... Feels like I'm playing a slot machine. Can you run any faster than that? Wow, that's a high jump. Holy shit. What was that? A piece of bread? Oh, okay. Bag of bag of gold coins. Some dude just standing there. Better go kill him. Oh, it's the same dude and his twin brother. <laughs> Oh, she's got a dagger, too. Westward did this? That's weird. Look how much, uh, like, um, geometry is changing as I'm moving forward. It's just sort of like a line for level of detail scaling. As you get closer to things, it throws in more detail. But it's such an obvious thing. There are so many steps that it's, it's kind of ugly. It's kind of weird to think that even when you're outside of like pure technical details, like being able to push the game to like poly, higher polygon counts or texture details or reducing loading times. Or, okay, that's what you're... Your father just died, but that's all you're concerned with. Okay. Oh, all right. I know there's treasure nearby. Yeah. Okay. What's with your accent? Give everybody friggin' stereotypical pirate accents. It's fine. You can do that shit. Especially strangely enough, although pirates didn't really talk like that. Well, nobody really knows for sure what pirates really talked like. One of the weird things that you see in a lot of... Like, uh... Well, there's a pirate accent, which just comes from a kind of, um... Is that the treasure you're bitching about? Oh, shit. Look at the size of those crabs. Why did the crab have gold? The fuck? <laughs> Does that mean I can move on now? You know, I think the big... Well, uh, you have... Well, okay, I finally got off topic. But... You have two sides of the design of games. You have the technical side, which is like graphics and being able to push things. Like there's actually a, a, uh, like the grass detail. You see like the grass looks good there. It sort of fades in. God damn it, girl. 
But you have the kinds of things that you think that developers would have been able to do on the PlayStation 2. Like, have the characters, uh, have better control for the characters, or whatever. Oh, alright. <laughs> That's not gold. But it, it is something that there, it took sort of a collective effort over all those years for developers to get really down with how... I need the iron key. Okay. For developers to really figure out how to effectively control a character in a 3D space. And it took a surprising number of years. I'd say it really wasn't until like the later PlayStation 2 era. I mean, there were certain platformers that pull it off like... Jack and Daxter, or, or or whatever. Jack and Daxter, or what am I? What am I thinking of? Uh, Sly Cooper. Those kinds of games sort of nailed 3D uh, control of characters. Oh, a horror-themed place. But it's something that's not really tied down to the, not really tied down to the technical limitations of the console. They really should have been able to do it had they just known how at the time. And this is a game that has shit controls. And, uh, up. Get him. Get him. Get him. There you go. I smell gold. Okay, I get it. You smell gold. The controller is rumbling. So it's probably rumbling as you get closer to, uh... Alright, okay, I'm, I'm done with this. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Scooby-Doo! Night of 100 Frights. I hate Scooby-Doo. It doesn't look bad, though. I mean, graphically, it doesn't look bad. Every damn episode was the exact same thing. They go into some place, some haunted house or whatever, and then they spend the entire time to figure out it's just some motherfucker in a mask. And I would have gotten away with it if you weren't for you meddling kids. I mean, every time. And, the, and Scooby-Doo... And that idiot stoner he hangs around with eat dog food. <laughs> and it's never really Scooby-Doo that does anything. Yeah. And it's like, they catch the guy at the end. Like, what do they do? They call the cops? Or, like, citizens arrest? Or they... Like, they're just a bunch of idiot vigilante Teenagers. <laughs> One of the stoner that eats dog food. Stunt man. Stunt. Oh my god, stunt man. I have a lot to say about this game. Because stunt man was kind of like an outgrowth of the Driver series. Because Driver came out on the PlayStation 1, and it was awesome. Say that Driver was sort of like the proto GTA in a sense. Even though Grand Theft Auto and Driver are contemporaneous, um, pounds of pressure. GTA was n not really a 2D game, but it was like played like a 2D game. It was overhead. The early GTA games, GTA, GTA 2, GTA London, whatever, were not very good games. I didn't like them at all. Driver, on the other hand, other, on the other hand, existed in a 3D environment. It had cities. It was great. There's not much outside the cars to do, and it wasn't like GTA that had no gunplay or anything like that. But it had the driving around the city, and that was really something in its day. Waiting for Driver to come to the PlayStation 2 was an agonizing experience, because like Driver was so awesome on the PlayStation 1. Another thing of, what's it going to be like on the PlayStation 2? Just like Medal of Honor. How great is this going to be? Now, instead of a driver coming out right away, what we ended up getting was Stuntman. 
Now you see all this crap going on here, but Stuntman isn't, you're not a criminal, you're not doing criminal stuff. Well, all you are is a stunt driver doing scenes for movies or doing um, like just stunts for a crowd. And the game is brutally difficult. You would have maybe like two or three minutes. It's been a long time since I played it. We'd have a couple of minutes of stunts that you had to perform in your car. Run up this ramp, make this turn, do this, do this, do this, do this. And you had a set amount of time to go and do all of these stunts. And it was more or less on a track that you had to go and run. But it was so, so very tight in terms of the time that you had. Is You had to complete every single stunt perfectly every time. Because one mess up and you don't have enough time to complete the, the track. And it was frustrating. It was not a good game. It's like, why did you waste time doing this instead of making a driver game? And maybe it was they wanted to um, get some experience developing 3D environments in the PlayStation 2 before they made a proper driver game. Because Stuntman is a smaller game. But, I mean, while they were wasting time doing this, Rockstar or... Um, DMA or whatever you want to call them at the time was doing Grand Theft Auto 3 which blew Driver out of the water and as much as there was at some time a rivalry between the Driver camp and the GTA camp there's no rivalry anymore Driver's dead GTA is king and um, Reflections or whoever the hell developed this let it happen Delta Force Urban Warfare I do not remember this Okay. <laughs> Might have to silence that because I'm assuming... I don't know what this song is, but I'm assuming it's some kind of um, licensed soundtrack. And I'm sick of seeing copyright hits on my videos. I'm, nothing's monetized or anything like that, so it's not something I actually have to worry about, but... <sighs> you know... It wasn't until, as much as you had like the Medal of Honors and all that kind of stuff happening on the PlayStation 2, Time Splitters was definitely like the peak of early PlayStation 2 first-person shooters. You also had like Red Faction and all that kind of stuff. But I feel like it first-person shooters in this generation of consoles did not come into their own until we saw Halo, which was on the Xbox, and... You know what? Uh, Half-Life. I forgot about Half-Life. And also... Oh, okay. We're at the end of these. You had Halo, and you had... Um, uh, Medal of Honor. Not Medal of Honor. God damn it. Call of Duty. Call of Duty was mostly known in this era. Maybe a year or so later it would come out as a PC series. Strange to think about it. Call of Duty was originally a PC game. But Call of Duty was a huge step forward in terms of... A huge step forward in terms of first-person shooters. And there were Call of Duty games on the PlayStation 2. Motion capture. Over the past several years, we've seen all the incredible progress in the quality of animation in sports games. Much of that has to do with the advances in motion capture technology. We wanted to know what goes into making all the moves on the field come to life. So we talked to a few of the experts down at Sony Computer Entertainment in San Diego to find out how they created the most realistic motion capture ever. The studio brings in talent. They suit them up in a motion capture suit that consists of some reflective markers or little balls. And they capture an animation and try to get a little lifelike motion. The technology that's and still used nowadays. Put them in front of 20 plus, you know, cameras. Although a lot more of the kind of like walking motions aren't strictly motion captured in terms of how well they look because it, it doesn't translate as well to like changing terrain or running into objects or anything like that. So motion capture is still used, but then there's some 
procedural techniques that go into like making sure that a foot only goes down so far or something like that when stepping on a hill or a rock or something like that or going up steps. But it definitely does work a lot better than just hand animating everything. I mean, like I've tried hand animating well, not animations and here, my god, that is tedious and I'm not good at it. Of course, other people are a lot better than me. That will send light out from the fronts of the camera, and it will hit these markers that are set to reflect about a three degree angle, and that light will bounce back at the camera, and then that camera can say, "Hey, I recognize a reflection." Yes, and they use these three D points on the body in order to determine, and then you link that to different parts of the character's body, and that. It's just when you get allows them to animate the characters. On a guy's arm, you know, it's it's really good for guy's sports arm, games, especially if we're looking at like baseball, where you're not going to have like in okay, football or tech boxing tech. or what something really where know is what games these you're not going to have characters on. crashing into each other like we're seeing in football right there. Job and our main focus is to facilitate SCA, whether they be game day or MLB or SOCOM. It doesn't matter if it's sports or non-sports, as long as it's an SCA game, we're available to assist. Seeing more and more of that kind of stuff being used was really important because um, PlayStation 1 characters didn't have a lot of detail, so they could afford to have Most of the games worse we on animations. We as the characters get more details in them, it starts to look stranger and stranger, like that pirate game we were looking at there. The characters don't have very good animations physically. It kind of looks strange. What in the hell is that? Well, this all sounds just a little too easy. Some of the harder things that we have to deal with is if you have two guys fighting. And if I have a marker on my chest and I cover it up with my hand, the cameras obviously aren't going to be able to see it anymore. That tends to produce the most difficult data for us to deal with. Sometimes the computer will get confused and the markers will swap. They'll change places and it disrupts the data and so we have to fix those swaps. Some of the stuff takes quite a bit of time to clean. It just depends on oh, it's the five quality o'clock. of the data. Uh -huh. It depends on how complicated All right, I'm going to have to go. And it depends on how many people are in the scene. Obviously, when we have real extreme motions, when they're bringing in stuntmen to do crazy flips and football tackles, that's really fun to work with because it's not only is it challenging, but it's just interesting to see those motions get transferred on the computer and work with those. But the coolest part of their job has to be working with all the professional athletes. Cool boarders, we had a lot of the professional snowboarders come in, which was really cool. So we captured their motions. Yeah, we have some cool names, some cool people that come through here. It's, uh, it's fun. We do get kind of high profile, famous people, athletes and stuff to come in for PR stuff to do like football moves or basketball moves. That's always kind of exciting, interesting to meet those guys. I've worked with Donovan McNabb from the Eagles, worked with Stefan Marbury and Michael Vick. Those three mostly. The coolest part of my job is the fact Yes, because everyone loves Michael Vick nowadays. To do it. That's the coolest part. It's every day coming to work, there's something new to work with. There's new emerging technologies every day that we get to look into and play with and be part of. Working in in this atmosphere is obviously a lot of fun. I mean, we're here to make games and everybody that works here plays games and loves games and uh, being involved in that atmosphere is just really exciting if you're a, you know, an enthusiast like myself. It is funny to um, see these old videos where, like, that didn't age that well. And sometimes it can be as simple as a person's name being dropped, like Michael Vick. I mean, he, his reputation took a pretty hard hit. And I mean, I mean, what do I have to say about that? It's not like I have a dog in that fight. But <laughs> and nobody knew. I mean, whatever. Biggest video game show of the year, E3.
Every year, the video game community gathers at the Electronic Entertainment Expo to show off all the latest in video game technology and software. It's E3, and it's a whirlwind of action and excitement, with amazing booths and demos from hundreds of companies, including Sony Computer Entertainment America. E3 is a show that was started back in 1995. Uh, it was actually a spin-off of CES show, the Consumer Electronics Show. And in fact, uh, PlayStation actually was the group that got the show really started. The exhibitors' booths at E3 are always incredible displays. But what's even more astonishing is how quickly some of them are created. I was approached probably two years ago by Exhibitors Magazine to do an article. Um, and they wanted to follow me around for a year because they were certain that it took a year to build this kind of a booth. And in actuality, we do it in four months, which is incredible. So how do you design, build, and assemble a 5,000 square foot mini city complete with elevators, coliseums, theaters, and restaurants in only four months? We try to start out with, with a one-liner from marketing about what our message is for E3. Like for instance, this year it's live in your world, plan ours. We're trying to develop uh, a little bit different look and feel for the booth this year, uh, which it would be less character driven and more technology driven to demonstrate the games. We feel that the graphics and, and, and the gameplay draw people into the game. And we really want to carry that immersive theme into the booth this year, rather than just having someone standing in front of a kiosk and experiencing the game on their own. We will be using different projection units that will allow a group of people to see one person playing on a game, multiplayer games being viewed from different angles, from different levels in the booth. So the idea is that for the, the planet PlayStation area. When you're up, you have one player here and one player there. Um, and, you know, this is From then, we go to an outside design firm. We have used for the last four or five years, Mitchell Mock. And he'll come back to us with as many as 10 initial concepts. The place that we start for inspiration is, you know, what is the information that we need to communicate? But beyond that, the actual sources of it, uh, inspiration are things like um, fashion design or how molecules go together. You know, we're always searching for new materials and how to use those in, in three-dimensional environments. And then they'll come across with maybe... All right, honestly, I don't care as much about this as they probably think I would. As uh, interesting as it is to see how the East 3 booths are designed and all that kind of stuff, I don't care about the shows. I just care about what they're showing at the shows. Once the design starts taking shape, it's up to Pinnacle Exhibits to build it. We then go on and produce all of the control drawings and the specifics as to how each piece will be built and then we'll send these pieces out to the various shops around the country to be produced. As the process moves on and working with these folks, we are getting video feedback as to the day-to-day -day process in the shops. Uh, we're flying out at different occasions to view pieces around the country that are being done. There are <sighs> okay, come on, I'm hoping this gets done. Up front, when we're in the engineering phases, we have our team here of, of detailers and engineers and project managers. Uh, but it's got to be expensive to do all of this, of though. Work, I mean, hiring all these people just for a go, build all this stuff, design all this stuff, just for a few days at a show, hoping to sell video games to people. Lighting crews. Now, I know that E3 was originally, like they, the guy had said it as an offshoot of CES for video games, but originally E3 and CES before that was a trade show just to let retailers know what kind of games are going to be coming out in the coming year. So the representatives for the retailers show up at E3 and they see like, oh, well, this game's coming out for this date, this game's coming out this date, this is this, this is that, this is going to be big, this is going to be small. So they know what to order, place orders for, and they have some idea what's going on in the industry. It quickly changed to being something more along the lines of a trade show for the press. So 
like these game magazines and websites go to these shows, report on what they're seeing. And you can see that was clearly the big change in the focus with how absurd these um, setups became. And the fact that a lot of games started being shown off well, well, well before release. Like, okay, so let's say Final Fantasy X that they're showing right there came out in 2002. You're not really going to be getting a lot of uh, retailers placing orders for that game coming out in 2002 if you're showing it off in the year 2000. And that's not the only last minute challenge they faced. So the it's like, why are you showing us off so early? Why? Well, because you're trying to the drum up interest in the game the with the press, and the press will drum up interest in your potential cars. buyers. And if you have a year or two of hype leading up to this game's release, it will sell better. But so revealing it two years before it's released does absolutely nothing for the retailers that you're supposedly there to pitch the games to. And had it sent over, the entire car was stripped and it was turned into a motocross car. And we we completely changed this car head to toe and put it on the wall in the last few days. All in all, the booth takes four months to build, 104 truckloads to deliver, and nine days to set up. But what happens to everything after the end of the show? After the show is over, uh, basically we have about 52 hours to take it down, disassemble it, put it back in the vans and bring it back to the warehouse again. The actual pieces... If they're specific to a game, we have given them to some of the developers to put in their offices or to That'd be, be cool. That'd be pretty cool. Events. We uh, recently took the Jack and Daxter display from uh, E3 to the opening of Toys R Us in Times Square. So we tried to do that. I guess that does help a little bit if they put into crates and stored in the vast warehouse repurposed to these things. Possibly never to be seen again. Oh my god, we have some Indiana Jones shit going on here. <laughs> Top men. Who? Top men. Whatever. Alright. <laughs> PC to PS2. Half-Life 2. Half-Life 2 coming out for the PlayStation 2 was a big deal. Because honestly, like I had said before, there was a moving on from the Doom-style first-person shooters on PC to things like like Half-Life or Unreal Tournament or something like that. Half-Life was one of those big releases. And hmm. gamers on each platform have preferences that have to be overcome. When we heard that Half-Life, one of the most popular PC games of all time, was now available on the PlayStation 2, we rushed out to get the inside story. Half-Life's pretty much a story of a guy who goes to work. His name's Gordon Freeman. He's just a pretty much average guy, though he does have a PhD, you know, he's intelligent. Black Mesa is a research facility, probably so secretive that not very many people know about it. Basically, they do a lot of scientific research on top secret stuff. He's doing some low-level work for the company. He's a, a research associate, they call him. Gordon doesn't need to hear all this. He's a highly trained professional. He's in this HEV suit, this environmental suit that protects him from the radiation. Uh, it's probably not a problem, probably, but I'm sure there's more discrepancy. He actually inserts this new uh, piece of material that they found on this other planet into this machine for research. A disaster occurs during this experiment, and it basically allows an alien world to come through a warp. Aliens start coming to the planet, especially all around their area. Sierra Online, the publisher of Half-Life, knew that the process of bringing the game to the PlayStation 2 was going to be tough. To help them, they turned to Gearbox, a veteran company that made their name making mods for Half-Life. Gearbox Software, they're actually a company down in Texas. They wanted to go ahead and get into the console market. Half-Life on PS2 is our first product on the console. Stay back! Gordon! Ah! 
we wanted to take advantage of the PS2 and its high-powered graphics chip, and we were able to put in a lot higher poly models, put in higher textures, really just made the game look a lot nicer. And we were able to add another big piece of content to it that wasn't on the PC as well. There's a shortcut to the training area that will get you to the surface. Good luck. That bonus, which should appeal to the hardcore Half-Life fan, is a cooperative mode called Decay. The was developed specifically on the PS2, it's not available on the PC, and it's cooperative play where you play as a character, Gina, who was in the original story. You play along with another fellow scientist, and you have to run around and use the other player to actually solve some of the puzzles that you come across. You can't solve the puzzles on your own, so you have to use the other one cooperatively. Fans of first-person shooter games on the PC often complain that controls suffer when a game is ported to a console. Sierra Online solved that problem with the PlayStation 2 in two ways. We wanted to make sure that we could come up with something that the player was going to have a lot of fun with. We found that putting a targeting system in would make things a lot easier on some people who may have a little bit of difficulty playing with the controller. So the targeting system you can use as long as you got your cursor over the enemy, you press a button and it'll lock on. Wherever he moves, you can shoot at him and not have to worry about him so precisely. Not only that, we took a few preset configurations that we thought worked really well, put them in the game, and we also allow the player to completely customize their configuration to however they like it. On the PC, Half-Life has more mods available than just about any game. And the mods will be coming to the PlayStation 2 as well. In fact, underground viewers will be the first to get the latest Half-Life mod, Uplink, and it's only available on the PlayStation 2. The PS2 version had mod support? As long as you have Half-Life on the PS2, you can enter in a cheat code and put this disc in, and it allows you to play a new chapter in the Half-Life story. The Uplink mod is hidden on this issue of the Underground, so it's up to you to find it. Well. I seem to be seriously wounded. Can we do this later? Half-Life was one of the first person first person shooters that really managed to integrate some type of story into the game. Honestly, it was not a very deep story or much of a story at all. Gordon Friedman isn't much of a character at all. But it did something, and it did something better than anybody else managed to. Half-Life was originally a PC game, but there were... Uh, Valve was interested a lot in console releases at the time, so they got Gearbox to do this one. Gearbox would eventually go and do, like, Gears of War and shit like that. But, um... The first version of Half-Life I'd played was actually the PS2 version. And the PS2 version was actually the best looking version of Half-Life released. Because it was higher, like, minimum bar than the PC version, which had come out earlier. I eventually went and I played the PC version as well. And, like, the PS2 version, I mean, it's, it's, it's a good first-person shooter for its era. But, honestly, like, as much as people, like, rant and rave about how Half-Life still holds up today and it's this great game honestly first person shooters from that era have not aged well in fact i think really that the earliest first person shooter that you can go back to that still plays decently enough would be probably the first call of duty and really even then it was like the expansion the call of duty that made it even better that was really the, what was it called, United Front or some shit like that? I forget what it was called. It was a better version of, of Call of Duty. So you can, you can play Half-Life and you get some nostalgia out of it. But it doesn't really stand up today as all that well. First person shooters aged quicker than other genres did at the time. Sort of like 3D platformers, same thing. They aged very quickly in this era. So as great as Half-Life was at the time, it's simply not up to snuff nowadays. Half-Life 2, on the other hand, a few years newer, a few years more advanced, Half-Life 2 holds up quite a bit better. Still doesn't 
in my opinion, hold up to the way that modern first-person shooters control or their level design or all that kind of stuff. But Half-Life 2, much better. Oh, good. We're out of these. <laughs> Download station. I'm a little weirded out by the idea of... Oh, Simpsons Road Rage, huh? James Bond, Agent Under Fire, Dark Summit. I don't know what any of these are. Bulletins. News. Uh. Yeah. Okay. Cool moves. Johnny Mosley, huh? Oakage Shadow King. Half-Life. Getting through the iron. So it's just gameplay Hi, my tips. Name is Saul, and today I'm going to show you a cool move for the game Half Life. Saul. In this cool move, I'm going to show you an entertaining scene that you might have missed. Let's take a look. When you get to the point of the game and the guard starts uh -huh. following you, make your way on over to the reception area. I mean, it's cool that they showed this kind of stuff here, but nowadays, like it's. On this computer panel right here, and that'll open up <laughs> these doors. Just make sure to duck when you go through these doors. And stand right about here and watch that dude's about to die. Oh, yep, there you go. <laughs> when you get out there, don't stand on the bridge. Stay by the doors and have fun. Yeah. Extermination. Holy Hi, shit. My name is Saul Wool. And today I'm going to show you a cool move. Yeah, we already game. met you. Extermination. In this cool move, I'm going to show you how to get some hidden items. In underground tunnel area A. Extermination was an early like survival horror game for the Probably PlayStation 2. In underground tunnel area B. I tried playing it fairly recently and my god has it aged poorly. <laughs> it's terrible. Climb up these boxes right here. And onto this truck. <laughs> and jump over the fire. Alright. Walk down this narrow path. I'll be sure to not do that. And go through the door that you just opened. You know, this is a necessary part of the game. If you're playing Extermination and you haven't gotten past this, you haven't played the game at all. You can always bypass this full motion video here just by pressing the start button. I remember Head thinking this game right was alright when it came out, but alright in 2001 over the train is, is at. trash in 2022. Climb up <laughs> over here on the other side and go past these boxes. Notice there's a padlock on this door. Simply use your knife to knock it off. It's a shitty padlock. <laughs> Access the voice the acting right in this here. game is atrocious. <laughs> I mean, truly, just absolute garbage. Now, as you can see, it's I mean, you think in the PlayStation 2 era, like you saw better voice acting in and the PlayStation 1 era as door. things went on, like with. Um, Resident Evil got better, but like Metal Gear Solid and all that. So you think that standards, the well, bar would have been set here, for better voice acting, but you know, this, it. it is so bad. I should do a run through of this just because of how terrible it is, but I really don't want to play it. <laughs> I really don't want to play this game. Here you can collect a booster shot type A. Can okay. also collect the MTS vaccine. All right, dude. And more importantly, you can collect the SPR4 magazine. Now that you've collected the more powerful SPR4 magazine and hidden items, you'll be better equipped for the upcoming battles. Good luck. Will I? I will, huh? Okay. <laughs> Johnny Mosley. Hi. No border. From the 3DO company. I'll be showing 3 cool company. For Holy Mosley shit. <laughs> for PlayStation 2. In this cool move, I'll be showing you how you can do rail to rail transfer to score major points, as well as open up an alternate path in the San Francisco level. So let's check it out. At the first set of cones, stay to the left of them and take the high road. No, snowboarding, skiing. This will eventually lead you to the alternate path. Oh my tunnel. god, look at this character model. It's hideous. <laughs> as you're approaching the tunnel, you can see the two times multiplier pointing you to where you need to go. Maybe I'm spoiled too much by SSX, but this game looks so slow. Holy shit! <laughs> it's getting absurd. Are you riding on a ski lift? 
No, there's a power line. Holy shit. Make sure you land this one next rail on the side of the building. Dude, no one's ever going to do this. <laughs> and now you'll be in an alternate path. And you have some major trick points. So for a little practice, this cool move will help you score major trick points and help you open up alternate paths in many other levels. I don't remember there ever being a Johnny Mosley game. So until next time, keep on tricking. I don't remember a Johnny Mosley game ever. All right, this is the last thing. Might as well watch it. My name is Saul, and today I'm going to show a cool move for the game, Okagi Shadow King. Okagi. I keep getting that name wrong. I keep calling it Oakage. To start off, you're going to need to get the message carrying bottle. I got the message carrying bottle at the lighthouse in Rochello. I just inspected the door twice and received it. Once you got the message carrying bottle, you want to head over to the circus just outside Rochello. Head over this bridge over to the circus area. Once you get inside the circus area, head over to this area over here and look for the Dreaming Circus Performer. But what? <laughs> Make sure to speak to this person. The Dreaming Circus Performer will teach you how to send messages in the message bottle. Now the bottle has been released into the water. Head over this bridge. You know, I wonder do is look how the many of these tips were actually beach. useful. I mean, that one with um, the Johnny Mosley game, if it found you to a new area of the track that you're not going to just find on your own, all right? But, like, this just seems like a regular part of the game, just like the extermination one. I mean, if you couldn't get your way through the early parts of extermination, you're definitely not going to be able to beat Head that game. To the Dreamy Circus Performer and repeat this process. It's like the very times. beginning of extermination. I don't know where this is in this game, Once but it's you probably the message early on. Times. Head back to the village of Tanel and go over to the elder's house. Speak to the little sick girl. Little sick girl. It's sickly pretty girl. Item. The handicap is a really cool item because it increases your attack, your agility, your luck, and your defense. So there you go. Have fun with your added abilities. All right, is that it? The vault. Okay, that's it. All right, so I guess my animation is going to be for Half Life. Anyway, that was an hour and five minutes. Thanks for watching. Boom.